Good morning. Let us begin our worship with a prayer, but before we have the prayer, though, I want to talk about a few things. Uh, For our visitors, we do have an attended nursery over this way, through that door, and then back into past the office. We also have an unattended nursery back by the foyer onto my uh, left. Um, Also, visitors, if you would please, in front of the, in the pew in front of you, there's a blue card if you'd like to fill that out for us so we'd have a record of your attendance. We're so thankful that you're here today to enjoy this worship. We ask that you would uh, maybe stick around so we can see where you're from and enjoy the time that we have with you. Let us bow. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day and for your blessings, for your watching care over us that we're here safely. We're thankful, Lord, for your son Jesus, and he loved us so much that he did come to this earth and die on the cross for us, shedding his blood to cleanse of our sins. We thank you so much for that, Lord. We ask that you would be with us on through this worship. Watch over us as we, whatever we're doing will be in accordance with your will. Help us, Lord, to always strive to do the things you want us to do, not what the world wants us to do. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I was reading we might be part of history today if we hit triple digits. And the thing that I thought was kind of amazing is that they said that this would be the 13th day in recorded weather that Colorado Springs would hit 100. So it feels like we hit 100 about every other day, but I guess I've I've been a little, uh, little too much. We'll begin this morning with the Lily of the Valley. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs has taken, and all my arrows gone. In temptation he's my strong and mighty power. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn from my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. Oh, a wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Very nice. Our next song will be Yes For Me, For Me He Careth. 292 in the book. Yes, for me, for me, he careth with loving, tender care. Yes, with me, with me, he shareth each burden and 
for the opportunity to assemble here freely in your name as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're just glad for this country and the opportunity that we have to do so and the freedoms that we have here. And Father, we pray that you will be with this congregation as we try to be lights in this community and help us to lead others to you. And we pray that you will be with the elders here, that you will be with each of them as they continue to attempt to lead here also and help us just to continue to do things according to your will and be a good force in this area. We pray that you be with each of the members of the congregation here that are sick and those that are mentioned in our bulletin, that you will see to their needs, whether they be physical, whether they be spiritual. And Father, we're just grateful for you. We're grateful for the word that you've given us so we may understand you, your will for us, and we know that only you are good and only your ways are good. And we pray that you be with the leaders of our country, and you, we always pray that leaders anywhere will seek your wisdom and then have the courage to act on that wisdom. And Father, we pray that you will be with Grady this morning as he brings the lesson of your word, and we pray that you will help us to continue to focus for the next little while just on you and on worship to you. And we just pray you help us to keep our thoughts centered and that this worship will be pleasing to you. So our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. In a few minutes we'll have an opportunity to partake of the Lord's table as we do each week. And prior to that, we'll sing the first and the third verses of Oh, the Depths and the Riches. Mm. Oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace Flowing down from the cross for me There the death for my sins by the Savior was paid And his suffering on Calvary Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless, simple, and free. And the death for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free, through his suffering on Calvary. 
Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the death for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. If anyone has need for the communion supplies, please raise your hand. We have some over here. In times long past, the prophet Isaiah foretold the coming of the Christ. He described his life, his purpose, his tribulations, and ultimately the reason for his death. In the time of King Herod, the Savior was born to us, the town of Bethlehem, and he went about his life fulfilling the purpose his father had sent him. It was in the last night before his crucifixion that he met with his disciples. And what we've come to know as the Last Supper in which, by commandment, we repeat this morning. He told them that the bread is my body which is given for you and the cup is the cup of the new covenant replacing all the things of the old law that had preceded it. So this morning, as we partake of the emblems of the Lord's Supper, let's remind ourselves that Christ came and stood on a cross where we should have been, taking away our sins by the offering of his life. A sacrifice from God that fulfilled a problem, a promise made long ago to Abraham that through him all nations would be blessed. And so this morning we're blessed to partake of this bread. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, all praise and all honor comes to you with the worship from our heart, the thoughts of our minds, and the hope that we hold in our bodies that the certainty of your promise is true. We're thankful now, Lord, to partake of this bread. Knowing as Christ said, it represents his body, which mere hours after he spoke these words led to his crucifixion. But by his crucifixion, O oh Lord, we have been redeemed, we have been saved. And for such a great gift, we offer our thanks to you and our praise forever. May all who take of this today be blessed in your sight. This we offer in Christ's name. Amen. And that blood represented by this cup is what washes away our sins and makes us white as snow. Let's pray. What encompassing love, O oh Lord, you have showed toward us that you have sent your only Son to redeem us from our sins and to provide a future, a promise, a hope which we can cherish and hold in our hearts. And as we partake of this cup, Father, we thank you for your enduring love and for the Son that went to the cross so willingly for us. 
May all praise ascend to your name and to him. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper for this morning. We'll sing two verses of This World Is Not My Home and contemplate the collection. I think. Mm-hmm. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can feel that hope in this world that ain't more. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can feel a hope in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The seats on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can be at home in this world anymore. The many ways to present our offering are displayed on the screen behind me. It's wonderful that we have a chance to present an offering to the Lord. We have been blessed with great prosperity. And so let's offer thanks together. Almighty God, our Father, when the widow offered up two mites, the smallest of coins in circulation at that time, She gave of her whole substance. Not that she was blessed with abundant riches or prosperity, but because she was blessed with abundant trust in you and your providence. And as we reflect, O Lord, on the prosperity that you've given to us, we pray that we might present an offering, Father, that shows the love that we have, the care for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and the hope that we hold in a time that we will spend with you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We know these funds will be used in good purpose, and we pray that we may do so in a way pleasing unto you. This we offer in Christ's name. Amen. And now for one of the most joyful parts of our service. Many of you know that we uh, collect in uh, change for the children at uh, Manuelito Navajo Orphan's Home. And our children have undertaken a task and a joy to uh, collect an offering, and so let me invite them to come forward at this time and present their offering in the can that lies in front of the podium.
If this is not a treasure in earthen vessels, I don't know what is. It's so much fun to watch. When you watch it from this angle, negotiating all of the things you have to do to get to the can is pretty challenging. It's interesting. Before we uh, stand for the Lord's prayer or Lord's reading after this song, uh, we'll sing unto the O Lord and let's stand for the song and then we can remain standing for the reading of the Lord's scripture afterwards. Mm -hmm. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemy triumph over me. Yea, let none that way on thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that way on thee be ashamed. O oh my God. I trust in thee, let me not be ashamed, let not my enemy triumph over me. Remember not the sins of my youth, remember not the sins of my youth. Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Good morning. I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, New King James Version. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You may be seated. This is the second Sunday in the month of July, as you very well know. And here at Pikes Peak, this calendar year, the second Sunday, we're presenting a lesson, preaching a sermon that ties in with our Bible reading program. And if you're not engaged in a regular, systematic approach to reading through God's Word, whether it's verse by verse and all the Bible verses in a calendar year or it follows a theme or a topic, you can join us anytime. At the back table and the side table, there are copies of our reading plan and you're welcome to pick one up and to go through the Bible with us. The second Sunday in the month of July, we are now more than halfway through not only this calendar year but our Bible reading program for this year and where has the time gone halfway through 2024 when it seems 
Only a few weeks ago we were saying Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And now we're in the 100 degree days of summer. And there on the monitor we won't go back and preach these six sermons. But we're kind of following along some favorite Bible verses. Okay, they're my favorite Bible verses. When you come up with a yearly reading plan, we'll let you do it your way. But you know, all of us, when we get together and talk about, I really love this verse. And when I look at this verse, what it means to me. Well, we would all have probably different lists, but a lot of the verses would be the same. And so we've looked at Psalm 107, let the redeemed say so. Paul told Timothy, we don't have the spirit of fear, of timidity. Let the redeemed say so. Who is on the Lord's side? Answer, here am I. And so there's a spirit of unity. And we're not shy in retiring and ashamed of our Savior, but we want to live our life so that the world will know Jesus lives in us. And the others, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, and Joseph told them, all the bad that you did, God turned it into good. And that's a wonderful thought. David the psalmist, Psalm 23, he restores my soul. Acts 13, the first recorded written sermon we have from Paul. He stands and he says it's through this man, this Jesus, that we have forgiveness of our sins. Samuel talked about the good and the right way. And then last month, there we find Elisha surrounded by the army of Syria and his servant was panicking and Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes that he might see what's what, what's really what. And there are so many truths that we need to open our eyes to see as well. But this morning we've got this reading from Philippians. And it's a familiar, and if it's not on your list of favorite Bible verses, whether it's top 10 or top 100, I don't know, but if it's not somewhere on that list, I would be mighty surprised. Paul writing from a jail cell. Paul writing in doubt of his own survival. Yet he declares to the brethren in Philippi, I hope to go on. I plan to go on. I'll leave that up to my God. But you know, even if I do, and I know the vast work that needs to be done, yet still, I'll never reach the point where I can coast. Coasting is one of the most pleasurable things in this life, isn't it? Paul says there's no time for coasting and certainly no cause for quitting. When I look at the world that is lost and undone and how desperately the world needs Jesus as Savior, Paul says I've got to go on and I'll never think that I have arrived but I'll not look in the rear view mirror. I'll look out that front windshield. Places to go. Things to do. My Lord needs to be honored and uplifted and glorified. But the part of this particular passage that we're going to emphasize, Paul talks about how that Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Jesus has got a grip on me. 
and because it's a favorite Bible verse. You know, we talk about our favorite Bible verses more often than we do those that aren't favorite. And so here's a passage that through the years we've preached on it, we've taught classes from Philippians. There's been devotional talks based on this passage, so I know you're as familiar with it as I am. But the way that we want to develop this morning that maybe we haven't covered or emphasized enough in the past is just this sentiment. Oh, my Lord, He has His hand on me. He has a hold of me. He has gripped me tight and close. And there's a reason for that. And there on the top of the monitor, you'll see the familiar reading from the New King James. And then underneath it, there are some other translations. And depending on the Bible that you're reading from, it may word it a bit different. But the sentiment, the thought, seems to emerge clear and steadfast for us. I lay hold on my God. And my Lord Jesus has laid hold on me. And that seems to be, at least in my way of thinking, a verse deserving of favorite status. Don't know who the artist was for this particular drawing. Kind of reminds me maybe of the story of Peter. Jesus walking on the water. And Peter thought to himself, I'd like to do that too. And Jesus said, come on. And for a few steps, Peter walked on the water toward Jesus. But you remember the story. When he saw the wind and the wave, how boisterous they were, he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And in your mind's eye, if you can imagine Jesus reaching out, reaching down, and don't you know Peter had a death grip on our Savior's hand and arm as Jesus pulled him up? Well, what a metaphor that is. What an image that is. What a meaning that is for us as we go through life. Here's the two-way partnership. Here's the two-way relationship. My God holds on to me. And with every bit of energy and determination and conviction that I can muster, I cling to my Savior's hand. You know the part that God holds on to us? That's a beautiful thought. And it's one that we see very often, isn't it? Hold to God's unchanging hand. It's one of our favorite hymns. Here at Pipes Peak, our song leaders regularly work that into the rotation. And there's a reason for that. Here's a meaning. Here's an emphasis. And hold on to God's unchanging hand. And you know, it's not just for a song that we sing, but it's one point of Scripture that is brought home and it's so powerfully stated, so eloquently expressed. Those people that are artists, created, they're very good in the graphic arts, and they take Bible verses and make artwork out of it. That's not me. But I've bought a collection so that we can put it up on the PowerPoint slides every now and then. Here's Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. And the Lord's promise, I will hold on to you with my mighty right arm. 
This morning, somewhat apology to Kevin and the other Benjamites that are left-handed in the audience. There's a symbol here. There's a meaning here. God doesn't have a literal right arm or a left arm or eyes or ears. And yet the Bible describes Him in that way because that's the way that we can understand His presence and His being. But the right arm, there's a meaning and a focus to that. You remember when James and John came to Jesus and there was the prompting of their mother as well. May we ask a favor of you? Can we sit at the right hand and the left hand of your throne when you come into your glory? Acts 2. Verse 32, verse 33, Peter preaching on Pentecost. This Jesus has God raised up and exalted Him to His right hand. Stephen, when he was being stoned outside Jerusalem and looking up, he said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And so here's a promise of God coming to our deliverance and empowering us and blessing us and keeping us. And it's by the power of His mighty right arm. And then we look just a verse or so later, also in Isaiah 41, Fear not, for with my right hand I will hold on to your right hand. And again, the meaning is lost if we hyper-literalize it and think of God as having that right hand and He actually physically and fleshly reaches down and grips us. But the idea, God telling Israel through Isaiah, their weakening faith, they're looking for signs and helps from any quarter and every quarter except turning back to Almighty God, here the Lord is saying, I haven't lost my love for you. I still have a plan for you. You're putting your future in jeopardy because you're not listening to me. But if you will, I'll hold on to you. And I will hold on to you tight. So it's a beautiful thought. It's one that resonates with us. God holds on to us indeed. But now then the passage not only talks about God holding on to us, but our holding on to God and God's hand on us. As Ezra besought the king of Persia that he might go to Jerusalem and help out the people of God as they were rebuilding the temple, the walls of the city, their way of life. And Ezra, isn't it remarkable that in two chapters the same expression is found one, two, three, four times? The hand of God was upon me. God was using me to accomplish something. I was God's lever. I was God's hammer. I was God's screwdriver. I was God's pen. However you think, I was the instrument in the hand of God and God was working through me well, that's just exactly the point and the emphasis that the Apostle Paul is making to Philippians. I wonder this morning how many of you have not heard a sermon. And we had one back in 2019. That seems like a long time ago, and it was. It was before COVID. And that's how long ago it was. But it wasn't an entirely original sermon. I can remember sermons even as a little boy. What is that in your hand? 
That's what God asked Moses, wasn't it? God was going to send Moses back to Egypt land, stand before Pharaoh. Moses says, I don't think you've picked the right fella. They're not going to believe me. They're not going to think that I'm on a divine mission. What in the world could I ever say or do to convince them otherwise? Moses, what are you holding in your hand? And it was a stick of wood. A staff, a rod. And whether you're thinking of a shepherd's staff with the crooked end on the top, maybe so. Or you're thinking about a walking stick like Larry has as he came in this morning. Makes no real difference. It's just a piece of lumber but you'll remember what God did through that stick of wood. Moses stood on the banks of the mighty Nile River and stretched it out, or air it, at his command. And the water turned to blood. Moses took that rod, that rod and struck a rock, and the water gushed out. And whenever Israel remembered their past, they commemorated Moses' staff. And there it was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. What a mighty symbol of God's amazing power. What is that in your hand? Well, there was David. He had a slingshot. And he picked up five little smooth stones from the brook of Elah. And there he slew Goliath. What is that in your hand? Well, you can go through both the Old and the New Testaments. And there we find sometimes it's a sword. Sometimes it's a pen. Sometimes it's another tool. And if you think of... God has his hand on us. Well, yeah, the idea can be that he puts his hand on our shoulder and there's the idea of comfort or reassurance. Or God puts his hand on us and there's the elbow and steering, guidance, instruction. That too can be a part of the symbol. But just as you and I sometimes pick up something to do something with it, and it can be a hammer, it can be a saw, it can be knitting needles, it can be a fork and a spoon, pots and pans, but we pick up something and we put it in our hands so that there's a work that we can do. And the more that we look at what Paul really said, I think this idea begins to emerge. Two different colors. There in the red, Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Why? So that I may lay a hold of that for which he has called and purposed me. Oh, it would be too much of a loose paraphrase. I've got Bibles on my bookshelves that seem to excel in that. The idea is not so much to give a literal rendering, but instead to bring it in words and languages that we can understand in our modern age and there's value and merit in their approach. So kind of taking a cue from that this morning, think of yourself as a number two pencil. And God has you in His hand. And not just to hold it, not just to tap it on the desktop, not just to twirl it in your fingers while you're trying to think of what to write, but instead, God has you and He is wanting something to be written, something to be done. And it doesn't have to be a number two pencil. You can 
fill in the blank and you can illustrate that any way that you want to. But what Paul is saying here, yes, God has laid hold on me and for what reason that I might go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That I might stand before kings and those in authority as Ananias told him in Acts 9. After that encounter on the road into Damascus, and as Paul was waiting for further instruction, God has a work for you. God has a purpose for you. And if you can visualize picking up a tool to get that work done, that's what the Apostle Paul, the way that he thought about himself, and that's the way I need to think about myself. That's the way that you need to think about yourself. There's a reason. There's a purpose. There's a plan. There's a destination. There's a way. And Paul says, God has His hands on me so that I might do the work that He has purposed me to do. Not exactly the same thought, but in somewhat the same way, a like imagery. There Paul would write in 2 Timothy, and here's one of the modern speech translations I consult every now and then. It's a bowl. It's an earthen vessel in and of itself. No particular value it's not fine china. It's not a museum piece. It's a working bowl found in any and every kitchen. But Paul says that's us. And if we cleanse ourselves, if we lay aside our old past, Paul says that we can be set apart and useful for the Master's service, made ready for every kind of service. A favorite Bible verse? Well, yeah, on so many different levels. Paul says, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to live in the past. I'm going to stretch. I'm going to reach. I've got my eye on those things that are before. And all of those are wonderful sentiments. But he also says this, and let's not overlook it. God has taken me into His hands to use and have useful are we. As I reflect upon my life, and as you reflect upon yours, have you been set apart for the Master's use? Have you been cleansed by the blood of our Lord Jesus? Have you made a determination that of all the ambitions in life, of all the things that we want, that we crave, that we think we need, and the things that we want to accomplish, is first and uppermost in our mind this prayer. Lord, take me and use me and make me an instrument of blessing. And that's why your hand is on me. This morning we would offer an encouragement. And maybe these are matters that you would consider and a response that needs to be made to be a part of the family of God as we stand and sing this song together. I was sinking deep in sin from the peaceful shore Every deeply stained within sinking to rise no more But the master of the sea Heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when 
nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be. Be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Good help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Please be seated. The final song this morning will be far and near. After that, we'll have some uh, closing prayer and some congregational announcements. Far and near the fields are teeming with the waves of ripened grain. Far and near their gold is gleaming o'er the sunny slope and plain. For the harvest send for free reapers here, a slope to thee we cry. Send them now the sheep. To gather ere the harvest time pass by. Send them forth with more first the evening. Send them in the noontide's glare. When the sun's last rays are gleaming, bid them gather everywhere. For the harvest sent for three reapers here, a sword to thee we cry. Send them now the sheep. To gather there, the harvest time has by. O thou who whom thy Lord is sending, gather now the sheaves of gold, heavenward then at evening wending thou. Shalt come with joy untold. Lord, a harvest send for three reapers here. A slow to thee we cry. Send them now the sheep to gather there. The harvest time. <coughs> Would you bow your heads, please? Father, we stand before you with humble hearts. We know that you are the Almighty God and that you see our efforts to love you and to serve you. You see how much we strive to be in your word, how much we pray, 
how much we meditate, how much we put your word into our hearts and into our minds and into our character. That, Father, no matter where we are, no matter what's going on, we choose to follow your will, we choose to follow your way. Father, we know that we are in this world and we are so thankful that we get to enjoy it. But we know, Father, that much as your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, was obedient to you in every way, you also ask us to be obedient to you. That it's not about the world. It's not about what the world believes is right. It's not about even what we believe is right, but it's about what your, your word says is right. Father, help us to have a conviction of heart and a conviction of mind, body and spirit, to do your will in the hard times and in the easy times. We pray, Father, that you would give us a desire to have a character that doesn't equal what the world believes, but a character of love and respect for those who are in our own families, those who we disagree with. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to remember that we are yours and that Christ died for each and every one of us. Help us to be about the duties, the responsibilities, Father, the spiritual maturity to love you, to serve you, to listen to your word, and to behave like it matters to us. We cannot control the world, Father. Well, we can certainly control our own hearts and our own minds. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for your spirit to guide us into all things. Father, we hear another portion of your word. We know that it has value for each and every one of us. Help us to take the time to meditate upon it, to love it, and to use it. Father, we have those who are traveling that you would, we pray that you would protect. We have those who are sick with all kinds of infirmities. We pray that you would guide those who are ministering to them, that they would have a measure of the help that you want them to have. Help us individually, as families, and as a body at this location to love you and to serve you and to demonstrate our love and respect for you as we go out through our work and through the community. Father, we pray for this nation. We pray for its leaders. We pray that your mighty hand would be upon their hearts and their minds and that they would be healthy and well and that we would all make the decisions that honor you. We pray, Father, that as we are about to I turn from this place that you would help us to do what's right, to love you and to serve you. Forgive the sins that we do, and we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.